Geos. Uh, Timestamp, Thursday, March 19th. I guess we'll say COVID day four. That's how I'm out marking all moments in time from this point forward. So here we are, the final chapter of Advanced Placement Human Geography. Mr. Williams, Mr. Chaining, we've reached uh, our finish line. And again, let, let's keep all, all thoughts positive and optimistic that AP exam is going to happen because you work too hard to, you know, to, to not be able to, to get to show what you know, but also to give a chance to, you know, to earn yourself that college credit. Save yourself a few grand, you know, you know save those G's, baby. Okay, so chapter 13, Urban Patterns. All right, so this is it. Let's get it, Geos. Come on, come on, come on. So what are we looking at? Here's your intro. A large city is stimulating and agitating. Entertaining and frightening, welcoming and cold. Oh my gosh, it's like some like Robert Frost poem or something. A city has something for everyone, but a lot of those things are for people who are different from you. Urban geography helps to sort out the complexities of familiar and unfamiliar patterns in urban areas. All right, look at those two cities right there, those two skylines. Do you know what cities those are? One of them I think is pretty is pretty easy. On the left, I don't know. Maybe you'll get the one on the right. Uh, so maybe that'll be an Ed Puzzle question from Mr. Williams. What are those two city skylines we're looking at? All right. Now, again, this this uh, chapter falls in what the College Board considers Unit Seven, and so the final section of Human Geography is focused on industrial economic development patterns processes, and it can it can make up between 12 to 17 percent of the content that would be found on the AP exam. You know, so again, it, it's a it's a pretty heavy focus. They like the later chapters to ask you things. I right, would go on this big diatribe about Vladimir Putin or whatnot, but I typically um, because we talk about Russia sporadically in this class. I have a weird fascination with Putin. All right, his history. Yeah, he's KGB. Did you know? And I don't want to go on all into it. All right, but it's it's a long thing. But Putin's an interesting cat only because uh, he's now in the process of amending the Russian Constitution for I think the third or fourth time. And he's got a chance to perhaps be president until 2036, which actually would have him being in power longer than maybe the most infamous dictator in Russian history. Who was it? Oh, well, you tell me. But again, he's BA, I will say. All right. So when our politicians like do fake stuff where they go around and like take photos and whatnot, dude really goes out and, and does things. I mean, look at those traps. Look at that trap game. Look at Vladdy, Vladdy P. So all kinds of stuff about him. I could go on and on. He's really, I mean, are you going to arm wrestle him? Are you going to beat the president? Are you going to believe Vladdy? I don't know. I mean, wild stuff, man. It's interesting. He's black belt, of course, in model. Calvin Klein model, it looks like. Yeah. Likes puppies, dolphins. But yeah, we go on and on. But we got stuff to do. We got stuff to do, stuff to do. Okay, there are your section breakdowns for chapter 13. Section one, why are downtowns distinctive? So you have the central city, or AKA the city. That's an urban settlement. It's been legally incorporated as an independent self-governing unit. It can also be known as a municipality. And, and so cities have their own elected officials. They can raise taxes. They provide essential services. So, so they're the local level when you're looking at local, state, and then federal governments. And so for us, you here in, in Anderson Township, you technically um, live outside of the, the municipality of Cincinnati. So if you're looking at this map, the reddish area, that is Cincinnati, the jurisdiction. You can see a couple places fall outside of that. Um, St. Bernard falls outside of it, famously Norwood does. And then you here in Anderson Township, there you are to the east of the map. You are not part of the, you're, you're part of the, of geographically the Cincinnati area. I mean, you have a Cincinnati address, but you don't fall in the jurisdiction of the actual municipality. So city, so the city services don't apply to you. So that's why your roads are always taken care of and whatnot. They're done by the township. You don't have to rely on the city of Cincinnati to come get your garbage and, and things such as that. You know, you, you, you rump, uh, rumpy comes out and gets those. Now, this is the important thing from section one, the CBD. You have to know what that means. The central business district. For us in downtown, it's really simple. It's this nice little, nice little square of activity in our immediate downtown. Now, because our city is laid out, one, we're small, but it's laid out really nicely, the CBD is easy to kind of pinpoint. In some cities, it's really, really large. Um, it's usually uh, not a very big area, 
when you compare the entire city itself. Um, but again, a CBD of New York is going to be way, way larger than you know the, the CBD of Cincinnati. And then when you look at our central business districts compared to European cities, they're also really different. Um, typically, um, our CBD is kind of within the city itself, whereas in Europe, they kind of have their central business district separate from the historical center of the city because they get a lot of tourists. There's a lot of history connected to it. They don't, you know, their their businesses, their their corporations, their skyscrapers are outside of the historical um, city itself, if it makes sense. Uh, Paris, for example, the CBD is not going to be near the Eiffel Tower. It's it's actually a few miles away from um, from like the old the old part of Paris. Here shows you the breakdown of Cincinnati, um, where our CBD ends, um, that's Central Parkway, and then that begins over the Rhine. And so that's a nice little easy way to know when you're in and out of the CBD there. Again, our CBD has some really, really big, big businesses. One of the most famous is right there, the Twin Towers of Procter & Gamble, one of the biggest Fortune 500 country, uh, companies in not just the US, but in the world. All right. uh, I was gonna go on a diatribe about the the your CBD versus others. I was going to go on a big streetcar thing. I was a big supporter of the streetcar, but your city government hem hawed with funding and they ended up forcing the streetcar to be as inadequate as it is right now. But you look at other cities like Indianapolis, they've really taken off and kind of really invigorated their city center. You know, they have their, their basketball arena, Bankers Life Fieldhouse, they've got Lucas Oil Stadium. Of course, me, the big Pacers fan, everything is easy, easily navigatable and really walkable. Whereas Cincinnati, we're still kind of finishing a lot of those projects, the banks and, and whatnot. Um, this here, this is the arrondissement map of Paris. So Paris is broken down into neighborhoods. They are numbered, and the term for neighborhood roughly translates or roughly um, connects to the word arrondissement. Um, so Parisians don't really say, I live on such and such street. They'll start by saying, I live in the fifth arrondissement or the eighth arrondissement and then they'll give us a, a street name or you know a landmark and so that's kind of how they navigate themselves but their cbd is actually um, on the outskirts of what is the old the old city of paris so their metro it helps you get around and so our cities are maybe not as connected with public transit whereas european cities are as well and this again was the streetcar thing i was going to go off on it on a tangent about it, it could have been really big and it, I mean, it could have even had like a, a direct line that got you to CBG from downtown and, and you could have had a line coming out here in Anderson Township. Yeah, but government, what are you going to do? All right, two definitions, MSA and MS small a. Uh, the me metropolitan statistical area, that's an urban area that has a population of at least 50,000. In the United States, we have over 300 of those, and more than 84% 80, of our population lives in what's called an MSA. This is very important for like census or when states are trying to track the amount of people that live in their state, because again, a lot of it is tied to districts, and districts are of course connected to voting and elections and what party is in power, you know, Democrats or Republicans. M micropolitan just means anything that's below 50,000. Read about St. Louis in your book. Do you know they used to have the, they used to have a floating McDonald's? They used to. See, keyword. It sunk. Yeah, kid you not. It was a little barge, and then unfortunately had a leak, and then boom, sunk. Poor Ronald McDonald. Um, damn. Downtown Mexico City, urban sprawl. Look at that. Incredible, incredible. Um, trying to go through quickly. In central business districts. The public services that are there are your typically your government agencies, but you'll have things such as a convention center as well. That's going to attract a lot of business, a lot of people to come there, you know, either as corporations or, or expos that are coming in. They're hopefully eating at your restaurant, staying at your hotel, spending money in your city. That's why the Duke Energy Center, your convention center, has really tried to up its game because, again, these, you know, these expos that come in or these businesses that want to come in and hold, you know, a, a week long summit there. You've got to do things that are attractive to want to bring them here. All right. Otherwise, they'll choose a different city to hold it. You know. So, what's going to drive them to come to Cincinnati? And don't say skyline. All right. Don't. That, <laughs> that's going to be maybe the thing that distracts. You know, that attracts them perhaps. All right. Yeah, I know. I just offend a lot of people, but get used to it. That's our city. We own it. A lot of people don't like it. Understand it. 
business services, advertising banks, financial institutions, law firms, consumer services. Uh, you're going to see again retailers that are looking for, you know, let's say it's a Macy's or they're they're selling any type of clothing item. They're going to have a high threshold, and a, and also a high range that they're going to be looking for. So. They're going to need people to come in, but they're going to need a lot of people to come in and use it because they're paying high rent. It's expensive. And so to to hold real estate in a downtown area, it's expensive. So you're going to have to have a lot of people coming in your store buying things. So that's important. Mm, yeah, you get that part. Not as important. Montreal's underground. There you go. They have like this underground city. Because again, a lot of the year it, there, it's really cold and it's not very hospitable to go outside, but you want people in the downtown. Well, this is basically a mall that spans their, their downtown. Pretty cool. Pretty cool there. Two, where are people distributed in urban areas? Um, this guy. Now we're getting into models. And, and so these definitely are important. Um, now, you're going to get a packet from us. Let's not, I don't want to say if, but when we do return to school, you're going to get a packet from Mr. Williams and I that are going to map out all the important models. It gives the model, it gives a breakdown, and how frequently they are seen on the AP exam. So it, it, that's going to be more helpful than kind of spending a lot of time in a, in a lecture on these. Um, but these models are important, I would say, because uh, they, they show you how cities are sort of organized, and if you will. Um, this model is called the Burgess model, but often it's just referred to as the concentric zone model. So that guy right there with the glasses, he said that cities start from the CBD, that's the innermost area of a, of a city, and then you have these nice concentric zones that, that build off of that. And so he, again, is coming up with his model in roughly the 1920s, 30s. And so American cities then, because he's focusing um, on America, they, they, of course, looked way different than how our cities have kind of now are, are constructed and also sort of how they've morphed into being these gigantic, you know, metropolises, um, if you will. But that's the concentric zone model. So you just have these nice rings. It starts with the CBD. And then as you move out the zone, it becomes different areas. Like you have a zone of transition, meaning that you start to have businesses in there. Then you have homes that are going to be leading you to the better residences, which is your suburbs. And then you have the even more rural area. Those are your commute, com commuters that because of transportation, because of the interstate system or cars in general, you can live outside the city and you can still get to work. All right. We used to always have to live in our city if we were working there because, again, we were, we were relying on our feet to get us where we were. Of course, strong buggy. And it's just, of course, not very feasible to do that. Sector model. Now, this is looking at the city of Chicago. And so the sector model says there is the CBD nice in the center, but everything else is sort of or sort of happens in sectors. So there's different sectors of the city that have kind of that pop up over time and and they are a varying type. Um, so you've got residences that'll pop up, you've got industrial areas that'll pop up. And again, this model is happening in the late 30s, early 40s. And when America is going through World War II, we're becoming the industrial giant of the world, and really we're becoming the superpower. Again, more time needs to be spent on that in the, in the future. Oh, there's the L, elevated train in Chi-Town. And again, the loop, if you ever hear people talk about the loop when they refer to Chicago, the loop is just the, 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 the actual CBD. That's the central business district where the train, the L, goes around. Right there. Multiple nuclei. Um, this is by Harris and Ullman. That's where they say there is the central business district, but then you have these nodes that are, that are um, sort of established around the city, and there is something specific about that particular node that's going to draw people there. So you might have a university node. You might have a medical node where all your hospitals are going to be located in the area. You might have an, uh, an airport node where you're going to have your, your international airport. Your parks district is going to have a particular area of the city that they claim. So it's kind of like these little, it, it, it's sort of is, it, it makes the city more and more spread out instead of having everything um, tightly packed this city is going to start to expand. And Houston, Texas is a good example um, of that. All right. So I think that's going to be it, gang. We'll um, pick up with another video to take us through, another lecture to take us through the rest of Chapter 13, and then you're all done.